Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 22nd of June 2021. Great to have you all on board. And um, it is a pretty important show, actually, a lot to talk about because of where the markets are and where they are perhaps likely to go. As with all of these things, no one's quite sure precisely how these things are going to play out. But, um, you know, I think we are at an interesting inflection point. And I'll try and share some of that data shortly to highlight uh, some of the issues. Just a couple of things I want to cover off first. Um, uh, just uh, by way of this introduction, uh, we, of course, go through our introduction, which is we're doing this house rules. I'll cover the models just very briefly tonight. But I really want to talk about um, some key data that we're going to run through and then we'll have questions and answers. The bulk of the conversations will be what you want to talk about, really. So uh, feel free to uh, ask questions as we go. Um, and in terms of the house rules and just to remind everybody, this isn't financial advice. We don't give financial advice on this channel. This is very much just a question of, um, you know, opinions. Yeah, sure. Um, some analysis, sure, but it's not financial advice. If you need financial advice, go find a financial advisor. Secondly, do play, play a nice in the chat room. No racial slurs, please. We do moderate the stream and uh, we have dropped a few people off. We don't like to do that. We do encourage everybody to share their views and opinions and chat in the chat, um, but uh, no racial slurs, please. And this is as of the 22nd of June 2021. I have got the date right today. <laughs> Good. And um, at you use that Walk the World to get my attention. There's always a lot going on in the chat, and this is a way of making sure that I see them. There is also Super Chat enabled. Wayne's already used it. Thanks, Wayne. And um, if anybody wants to make a contribution to help us, uh, with the shows, then Super Chat is a way to do that. Or if you want to get your question to the top of the list, again, Super Chat enables you to do that too. Now, just to to talk a little bit about Tony Lecandro. Tony was due to come on tonight, and up until this morning we were expecting him, but unfortunately he's had some family emergencies that required his attention today. So, um, Tony, our thoughts are with you. We're missing you. We were going to play Lecandro Bingo, of course, with all of the um, all of the sandpaper to death and all of those sorts of things. But uh, anyway, uh, Tony, we're wishing you the best with everything you're dealing with at the moment. I know it's a bit of a chaotic time for you and hopefully you'll come back uh, on in a future show. Looking forward to that. Just also while, I've, while I'm on, just to mention the DFA one to ones, we are still providing this service, got quite a few in the pipeline at the moment, and uh, that allows um, us to have a chat about a particular suburb. So if you want to have a one to one conversation about a specific suburb, not financial advice, but I can talk about the underlying trends, the stress and those sorts of things based on my modelling. And uh, you can also book a time about for an hour or so via Zoom or a phone discussion. And uh, there's a bit there is a cost involved that's to cover the cost of the research it takes about a day to do the research and uh, typically three to five weeks out simply because there's so much going on at the moment so many people want to uh, advice about what's going on can't give specific advice but i can share my data and of course that data comes from my core market models which uh, are essentially my surveys and other things and uh, now let me come back to this slide this is from the reserve bank so um what I want to do over the next few moments is just to paint a few pictures and try and give you a bit of a sense of some of the things that I'm looking at at the moment to try and get a read on where our economy is and where the global economy is and where the financial markets are. Because the critical question when you come to thinking about investing is what is going on contextually speaking. Now, for example, the RBA presentation from uh, Lowe recently made the point that our employment, the change of employment in Australia is a lot stronger than many other countries. And our GDP growth is also a lot stronger. So superficially, at least, you might argue that, in fact, um, things are looking pretty good at the moment. That's what the RBA says anyway. Savings ratio, of course, is falling now. It went up very high, up to more than 20%. It's now dropping. And that's because we're spending a lot more than we were spending previously. Um, and uh, we were saving last year when we couldn't spend. Now we're spending a lot more. That's one of the reasons why 
um, the stress data is actually rising. So as more people drain their savings, it means that they've got um, you know, less reserves and that and creates issues later. So watch that savings ratio. If it continues to fall, as I expect it will fall, uh, that's going to be a very significant uh, event in my view as things move forward. Um, we'll see how quickly it drops, but it is moving back very smartly. And remember, of course, the base effect um, because, of course, there's a big run up. So we're going to see a big run down as well. Now, uh, another rather interesting piece of information is this. Um, the wage price index is showing, well, not a lot really, and this is from the Reserve Bank. The wage price index increased by just 1.5% over the past year. Wage growth slow in the private and public sectors. It's noteworthy they said that even in these pockets where firms are finding it hardest to hire, workers' wage increases are mostly modest. There are some exceptions to this, but they are fairly isolated. In other words, no wages growth for you anytime soon. And that's a very important indicator of whether inflation, driven from specifically wages, is likely to come through. My own view at the moment is that there's very little evidence that that's going to be the case. And whilst there might be inflation in some asset prices and some other costs, no inflation in wages for any time soon is what I'm reading into that. That's quite important, of course, because if that does change, then that would be a significant turnaround, as we saw in the um, 70s and the 80s. But the other interesting question is, what is the real number when it comes to unemployment? Because there are actually a number of different data points out there. Of course, the ABS data came out at um, uh, 5.1 and they said, oh, this is a reasonably really, really good number. Um, remember, of course, the base effect is still is still there. 5.1%. Um, but the uh, Roy Morgan number came out with a very different number. Um, this is actually a slightly uh, mismatched in terms of timing, but essentially Roy Morgan is talking about 10% um, and the underemployment and unemployed at 18.9%. And the other factor to bear in mind is that the non-residential workers dropped dramatically. So what that means is that there's around 330 people now working in Australia doing jobs that were previously done by non-residential workers. But interestingly, non-residential workers are not included in the core employment numbers. So what that actually means is that the true unemployment number, if you calculate on the previous basis, is closer to 7% rather than 5%. So I think we need to be cautious about claiming victory when it comes to unemployment. And it's interestingly, very interestingly, a lot of the lower levels of unemployment are actually in regional areas where a lot of the uh, non-residential workers would have been doing the work previously, whereas now what it means is that those that work is being done by locals. So we're not necessarily comparing before and after. And in fact, um, Roy Morgan makes a very interesting point with regard to this. They're basically saying that if you compare today with early March 2020, there are nearly 600,000 more Australians either unemployed or underemployed, that's up 3.3 percentage points, even though the overall employment number is now higher than it was pre-COVID, right? So we have to be really careful about the politicians' spin here, where they claim that the economy is booming and everything's wonderful. 600,000 more people, 600,000 more with either less work or no work, that is a really big deal. And I think you know, we should put that in context. It's also worth noting that the Roy Morgan data says that unemployment is now lowest in New South Wales, down 1.9 points. The other states um, didn't drop as far. And in fact, they also make the point, very interestingly, of course, that New South Wales and Victoria took the bulk of JobKeeper, the 89 billion JobKeeper wage subsidy, with 30 billion or 33% handed to New South Wales and 28.1 billion, 31.7% percent delivered to Victoria. Now, of course, it's no surprise at one level because they're the biggest states. But nevertheless, it is interesting to see that distribution. And it's interesting how unemployment increased in the smaller states in May and was up in Western Australia at 11.7 percent, up 3.7 points, South Australia at 12 percent and Tasmania at 11.7 percent. And they do make the point that part of this is to do with part time employment. 
And that's something else that we should bear in mind when we think about all of this data, the difference between full-time and part-time work, because it's not the same, of course. And um, one of the uh, things that I keep observing in my surveys is that more people have more part-time work, multiple jobs, than previously. And that takes us to the underemployment discussion. This is from the Reserve Bank. So the RBA defines an underemployed person as someone who is currently employed but would like to and is available to work additional hours. So you could have more than one job. There still could be a shortfall in terms of preferred hours. And it represents spare capacity in the economy. And they said that over the last 40 years, the share of part-time employment has roughly doubled from around 15% uh, to around one third at present. And the rise in part time employment has been a key driver of longer term increases in underemployment rates. Now, that is sort of partly true, but again, my surveys highlight that a lot of people don't want to be underemployed. They're actually forced into multiple part time jobs simply because there's no other option, they can't find a full time job. And it's also interesting if you look at the wages that are coming through the multiple part-time jobs total up the total wages that they're actually getting, it's a lot lower than it would be if they were in full-time employment. So there is a direct correlation, in my view, between underemployment and low wages. And that's something which I think that the Reserve Bank is underestimating in terms of the economic impacts on what's going on at the moment. There's another interesting factor that's worth reflecting on too, and that is that the... Um, changes to this underemployment rate is actually quite significant. It does vary by industry. So accommodation and food has the highest share of part-time workers and also the highest unemployment ratio, underemployment ratio. And you can see there that the changes in underemployment, that's the one on the uh, left-hand side, is pretty significant at the moment. Uh, and so this tells you something about the structure of the industries where the part-time jobs are where the underemployment is and I think it's a very interesting set of correlations which um, is worthy of more detailed study but just to highlight that some of the growth areas like in healthcare, as well as in admin and support um, are actually areas where there is a lot of part-time work and where there is a lot of underemployment I think those things are quite significantly related actually now, the next thing to talk about is the ABS published payroll data today. It fell by 0.9% nationally in the fortnight to the 5th of June. That was following a 0.4% rise in the previous fortnight. Now, that's obviously to do with the lockdown, partly. Almost every industry in Victoria saw a fall in payroll jobs during this period. The largest fall seen in the accommodation and food services and arts and recreation services, down 10.2 and 8%. Each lockdown they said sees falls in accommodation and food services payrolls reflecting the impact that restrictions are having on the industry. Um, and interestingly, the Northern Territory was the only state or territory with an increase in payroll jobs in the industry over the fortnight. So you can see there a considerable fall, down 10.2% in Victoria. But interestingly, it spilled over to other states too, including Tasmania down 3.5%, South Australia down 3.3%, the ACT down 2.2%, Queensland down 2%, and Western Australia down 1.1%, and then we've got New South Wales and only NT where it's gone up. So again, another factor to bear in mind, uh, and maybe a reason why the overall levels of stress are actually still quite high. Another, here's another data point for you. This relates to the confidence. So the consumer confidence was up this week, according to Roy Morgan, and they basically said that the strong labour market recovery provided a boost to consumer confidence with a small gain, 1.3%. And the strength in the employment data overshadowed news about the emergence of the COVID cluster in Sydney. Well, we'll see about that. Confidence in the city rose by 5.2%, while in the rest of New South Wales it gained 28 But just to highlight the fact that the confidence levels are still not that flash, and if things get worse in New South Wales, and particularly in Sydney, and we are wondering whether there might be a lockdown of some sort coming, that could have another significant dent in terms of confidence. So this ain't over yet. And that then takes me just to recap the stress data that I shared with you last time. Mortgage stress is still quite high at 41.1%. That's more than 1.5 million households. A lot of those households are people with multiple part-time jobs, with big mortgages, with um, issues with 
uh, you know, getting the work they want, and also quite a few of them in those industries where they've got lots of part-time work and where you've got also issues relating to lockdown. So this is an, another indication, I think, that we've got to watch this ahead. And uh, for those who didn't uh, see the show last time, I, I, shared, I just to share the um, basic data again. I won't go through it in detail, but just to say that um, mortgage stress is at 41.13% which is 1.5 to 8 million households. And rental stress shot up 38.24% of households in rental stress at 1.9 uh, million households. And that's because a lot of people have been pushed out from where they were renting. Their rents have been increased. And at the same time, their income is being squashed. So that's another factor to bear in mind in terms of the overall economic output. And, and the point I really want to make is that whilst at the top line, some people may say the economy is doing pretty well. Um, there are also some negative indicators that it's really important to get your head around to get a balanced view of how well the economy is going. I will just briefly touch on this from SQM, just to highlight the fact that the auction clearance rates are actually, you know, all over the place, really. 61% in Sydney, um, but again, not a vast number. Volumes are not actually that strong, despite all the spruiking in the mainstream media. And I think that's important. The SQM data is the most accurate that I've seen with regard to what's happening with auctions. And in some other places, the auction rates are pretty low. And Perth, of course, um, hardly at all. And interestingly, the growth in Perth in terms of what's happening to house prices is pretty flat. And it's quite interesting to try and understand why that is. And the answer is, why is it that the momentum in Perth is not stronger? The answer is, the lending is tighter in Perth. The, the banks are still quite restricted in what they're going to lend over in the West because of some of the other earlier, earlier um, cycles of issues. And the fact that we've still got people who actually saw prices higher back in 2013 than they are now and are still in negative equity. So that's also another break there as well. So there are some structural reasons why it is that Perth property prices will not be moving up anything like as fast as in perhaps some other places. And I actually have a, some early data, which I'll share with you in a future post when I've done some more work on it, to suggest that we may be coming off the top of the growth rate of prices, particularly in houses and particularly in some areas of Sydney and Melbourne. So maybe the spike in prices is actually beginning to, to ease back. We'll see. It's early to say, but um, that's what I'm beginning to form a view on. Now, if I then go more broadly and just talk a little bit about the US markets, because, of course, whatever we do and whatever we think about uh, investing in um, the local markets here, we need to be thinking also about what's happening internationally, because, frankly, what happens over there has a very significant impact with what happens here. And uh, there's some very important information now which I want to share with you, which to me underscores why I am still of the view that we are probably going to see some market corrections later in the year. I don't know quite precisely when, and I don't want to be like Harry Dent when he keeps saying, well, it's going to be next week, next week, and next week, and then it sort of kicks on and it doesn't happen, right? But the fact of the matter is the conditions are now there to suggest that we are going to start seeing a correction relatively quickly. And let me share with you some of that information to try and give you a sense of why I'm saying that. This is actually from stuff from Bloomberg out today. And the really interesting thing is that, in fact, the Fed is already squeezing. And so this is a chart of the annual real M2 money supply here. And the right scale is the US federal deficit as a percentage of nominal GDP. And Essentially, what this tells us is that over the last couple of months, the liquidity is actually being drained away, partly, of course, by the actions or inactions of the elected politicians, as well as what the Fed is doing. And while they're still doing their $120 billion a month in terms of bond purchases, the overall net position is actually going into reverse. Now, if you think about the consequences of that, if you think about the fact that we could be in the situation where essentially what we've got is liquidity being drained out of the system, and that is actually not indicative of very strong inflation, nor indeed very strong economic momentum. And as Biden is still struggling to negotiate uh, a, an, a further stimulus package, 
which may or may not come through. We're not sure what size it would be. Heard all sorts of numbers being thrown around. This is a very important number because this is showing that the Fed is actually squeezing already and the US economy is therefore being squeezed. And that will be a very important factor, I think, looking forward. Now, here's another piece of information which also um, sort of just builds onto that a bit further. So this is showing the sorts of impacts that have to the markets when there is monetary tightening. And you can see here the one on the left hand side shows that um, in extreme monetary tightening you can actually get a fall of well, 46.5% is what they're modelling, 25% in a slightly uh, average tightening and a mild tightening, um, uh, a lower 19%. But there's still, there's still some very interesting stuff there. And this is from 1970 to 2021, some analysis done. And you can also look at the S&P 500 with fiscal tightening. And again, you can see 36% in an extreme fiscal tightening, um, a lower rate for average and a lower rate for mild. So together, what we can actually say is that the sources of new money suddenly decreasing, either fiscal and or monetary, um, are able to have a very significant impact on the market. And so the conclusion that they came to was this. On that basis, the odds of a forthcoming fall in the stock market has become very significant. On this reading, we had seen a gradual dawning on investors' minds that the speed of help for them was slowing down, which crystallised in last week's FOMC. And sort of the conclusion of that is that the latest Federal Open Market Committee meeting was bond positive and stock negative. So put that together with the earlier data that I shared with you, and you can perhaps see some of the ambience that's going on at the moment and why it is that things may not be as strong as superficially they appear. Now, here's another piece of information, and that's about US production. And this is a long term chart from 1950 to 2019. And basically what it showed is that manufacturing basically stopped growing about 20 years ago. It's gone up and down a little bit, but basically hardly anything. And yeah, sure, there was the NAFTA trade agreement. Uh, there was the Chinese access to world trade in 2001. That probably had quite a significant impact. But there is not much evidence of production growth in the US. So that's a very important uh, observation, because what it means is that the bulk of the US economy then is being driven by things like housing and lending to, uh, to households. And also, of course, all the financial markets and the financial services stuff. But real meat and potatoes activity in the US relating to production actually has stalled for the last 20 years. That is structurally a very important issue. And the conclusion of all that is we might actually be quite close to midnight. So uh, again, from Bloomberg, the S&P 500 moves sideways for months after the Nasdaq peaked in, in 2000, you know, so basically um, there was a, a peak up and then there was a Nasdaq fall, but the S&P went sideways and down. And the question is, could you actually analyse that Bitcoin in a similar way? You know, is, has Bitcoin basically called the, the top, as it were? And it, could it be that the S&P 500 is due for a fall? So those are the sorts of some of the questions that some serious analysts are now beginning to question, as, which may be where we are. So whilst we are at strong positions at the moment with regards to the markets here and over there, the question is, what's ahead? Is it likely that uh, things will go higher? Or are some of these factors that I've explained um, really suggesting that it might go the other way? And if it does, that means that there is potential for considerable market corrections. And to put this another way, this is from um, Morgan Stanley, basically said the tightening, you know, began months ago. The Fed's pivot to begin the tightening discussion caught most by surprise. Markets began discounting this inevitable process months ago, in our view. It's actually at the mid-cycle transition. It transitions all it out. Until M2 growth is done deaccelerating, the transition is incomplete. In other words, we are in a tightening phase already. So the conversation about the Fed tapering and all of those things is sort of missing the point. 
Um, that's what Morgan Stanley is arguing. I think there's some truth in that. And they also went on to say that if you look at it carefully through different um, types of um, assets, the more um, uh, risk on assets are the ones that potentially are, are moving differently to some of the others. And so therefore, the um, stimulus programs, etc., etc., and the other things could mean that we are there's potentially a risk of overconsumption quite recently turning negative and that means that basically the positive effects on income from the stimulus checks and the surge in asset prices including crypto all fade and so that could be what's ahead of us now if that is true that's a big deal so i thought it was worth just sharing that information um, and um you know, there was one last chart that they put up, which I thought was quite interesting, that the US money supply uh, is slowing, uh, global M2 is slowing. And so essentially, maybe valuations and relative revisions have turned down. And if we're right about that dynamic, then markets are probably overvalued and will correct. It's just a question of when. And it's not necessarily going to be triggered by the Fed starting to taper the structural changes are already in the system all right that's a really important thing to understand in other words we are already in a tightening phase and nobody really wants to talk about that but that's probably one of the most important factors to think about okay so i think that's a good place probably to uh, break the, the the presentation at this stage um i wanted to go through that in sort of a structured way because for me there were some really really important messages there but you know i could be completely <laughs> completely wrong on it um but i do think that we are you know facing some quite interesting challenges ahead and i thought what i might do just before i look at the chat in more detail is just um have a quick look at the markets insofar that um yeah, you know it's been quite an interesting ride um this is actually the um the let's just go down here and have a look at a couple of the uh the charts right so this is um the uh, asx 200 which um did pretty well today it was at 1.48 percent to 7342 the financials were also up strongly two percent to 6700 6575 the volatility index was down 6.76 percent right and the banks were doing pretty pretty well here um of course bank of queensland in particular which was up more than five percent uh at 926 is reacting to the uh confirmation of uh, the me bank merger so that's one of the reasons that that's there but this is quite an interesting one insofar that the aussie dollar is now dropped it's around 75 and uh, so you can see that that's um, not as low as it has been, but it's still <laughs> pretty low, frankly. Um, and I thought this was quite interesting too. The three-year bond rate is now up, right? So we're starting to see a rotation in terms of short-term, long-term. That's three-year, and that's the 10-year, right? So in other words, rates nearer term are perhaps higher. Now that could be quite interesting. Now um, I will just quickly touch on the Dow Jones, which of course did quite well. Um, it actually was at 1.76% yesterday, having of course fallen the, the previous day. And the um, S&P 100, a bit the same really. And the 500, of course, the critical 500 also um, was at 1.4%. The um, NASDAQ was also up 0.79% and the VIX volatility index was up just a little. But of course, um, the techs were up quite strongly, uh, whereas of course, as we discussed in the pre-chat, you know, the Bitcoin was down 5.16%. Um, down as I discussed in my earlier post, that's partly to do with China coming in and saying no more Bitcoin mining and no more Bitcoin trading in China, right? Now, whether that will stick, who knows, but pretty significant ethereum was down 6.6 percent uh, and um uh dogecoin or doggy coin depending on what you want to call it was down 20 percent uh, and um even um coinbase the uh you know big trading company was down 2.92 percent and interestingly the um uh 
you know, the, the various cryptos, whether you, wherever you look, is pretty much um, uh, exhibiting the same sort of stuff. Now, obviously, the, the ones with a stable coin haven't moved around as much. but So we can see that there's a lot of volatility here. And remember that a lot of people benefit from volatility and trading volatility, right? And, uh, you know, particularly some of the large firms um, have reported significant financial profits over the last quarter because they've been trading very volatile stocks. And, of course, crypto is another thing. So it's pretty interesting what's going on. Um, right. Now, with that um, introduction, let me just um, come back here and um, see what else is uh, going on. And, uh, Jason, I really appreciate the, uh, the contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it really is appreciated. Um, now, TB said, I know that our stock market just follows the US. Does that mean the Fed government has no control on when our market goes? Well, I think the truth is that our market mirrors very strongly the US. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, of course, we get a lot of our investment internationally from, from the US. And I'd also make the point that the size of our market is so small relative to the Fed, so that whatever the Fed does, it has a massive international flow simply because the US dollar, of course, is the international base currency, as it were. So that's, that's the reason. Now, of course, we have a higher exposure to resources. And up till quite recently, that higher exposure to resources allowed us then to essentially slightly distance ourselves with regard to China because of the very strong um, trades with China. That's beginning to change. And as that begins to change, it's going to be a much more connected set of movements to the US. So whatever the US does, frankly, it's going to come over here. It's quite clear. Now, um, Debt and Regret asked this question. And the Australian housing bubble seems to be bulletproof. Will it ever come back to a realistic price, even if we have a market correction in the higher prices? Now, that's a very good question. And thanks for the, uh, the, the super chat as well. Look, I think we have in this in Australia, and I've gone through this in a number of recent posts, we have massive government reserve bank support to the housing market directly and indirectly. And that's including the term funding facility, which is coming off at the end of June. That means the banks will not get the cheap money anymore. They'll have to actually raise it either from deposits or maybe from international markets. So there's a upward tick on mortgage rates. We also know that the government has thrown yet more money to try and get more first-time buyers into the market. And just be to be clear, I want there to be no doubt in anybody's mind that those first-time buyer incentives are more about protecting the construction industry than they are about helping people to afford to get into the market. Right? Housing affordability is chronically bad at the moment, and there is no plan anywhere at a federal or a state level to deal with it as there is no plan to deal with the social housing needs that we actually have across the country. So if they were serious about tackling this, those are the some of the things they'd be doing. But they're not. What they're paranoid about is any risk to the banking sector. Now, because the banks are so leveraged to property and because they've basically been lending very hard, what they want to do is to keep prices up. Now, the question is, is that feasible given the income multiples that we know about? given that perhaps one in five loans now have liar um, loan um, components to it. There was a report today that suggested a lot of people weren't telling truths about their own financial position when they were applying for a loan. Um, there are lots of issues there. Plus, of course, there's the interesting question about responsible lending. Will that get swept away or will responsible lending stay? Um, there's no news that I've heard so far as to whether the, um, the Greens have actually brought their motion yet, but they're planning to whisk the changes to responsible lending away so that consumers are still protected, that could be another factor. And so there's a bunch of things going on here which suggests to me that in the short term, the strong momentum of house price growth is probably going to ease back from this point. In fact, my modelling is suggesting small levels of growth in some areas, particularly houses, less units. Units are way down in most uh, uh, the metro areas, even now, um, and down 20% in some cases. Houses quite different. So a lot of houses, particularly at the upper end of the market, are actually still rising a little bit. But you've got to understand this important point. The way the metrics work in terms of house price growth, it's based on the transaction throughput, right? Transaction throughput is not that strong, despite what everyone's been claiming. And transaction throughput is skewed to the top end of the market, where people have been spending big bucks without a mortgage because they've got the money to buy it. So 
that part of the market is actually a little bit disconnected from the, you know, the meat and potatoes type of mortgage. If you look carefully at house price movements in the middle end of the market, as I have, it's certainly not growth everywhere. And in fact, um, I was looking at uh, a suburb which I will put up over the next couple of days, uh, just um, you know, in the in the urban ring uh, in Sydney, where there was growth last year, but there's been no growth this year at all. And that's in houses. And the average house price there was about 1.5 to $2 million. So the point I'm trying to make is that, sure, we're in very high plateau territory. All of the incentive schemes and all of the processes from federal, state and the Reserve Bank is trying to keep this bubble up. But we are still ultimately in the situation where we're way above long term norms. And then it's a question of can they go on throwing enough stuff to try and keep it up? Or will it ultimately begin to correct? And my own view would be this. If we start seeing the stock market beginning to move down, um, that could be the start of the, the next down phase. If we see focus from the Reserve Bank on loan to income ratios or debt to income ratios. And of course, I shared again a post a couple of days ago with regard to New Zealand and what the New Zealand Reserve Bank is talking about there about um, putting hurdles so that banks can't lend as much. If any of that comes through, that could be another negative impact. Remember that the migration is zero or close to zero, other than some Australians coming back, many of whom are coming back with big buckets of money from working overseas. So they are buying into the top end of the market rather than at the bottom end of the market, very different from previously. And of course, the um, supply of investment properties is still quite strong. They're still building way more. They're still wanting to put more planning applications in. So significant supply. And I've said several times, you know, the critical thing <laughs> to bear in mind is that we've got 1.2 to 1.4 million spare properties across Australia. So there is very little supply side issues, despite, of course, what the real estate sector and the construction sector are saying. This is all about debt, credit, saving the banks. So ultimately, the question of what happens to house prices is how much more will the Reserve Bank and the government do to protect the banks? That's the key question. And on past history, they will do a hell of a lot more. So I don't believe necessarily that prices will slide quickly, but they will probably go sideways and over time, perhaps adjust down a little. It's interesting that even in New Zealand, where they've started intervening, price growth is still there. It's just not quite as strong. So that's probably the way that I'm thinking about it. All right, let me go back and have a look at the um, some of the comments and see what questions that have come through. Um, a lot of questions, of course, as I... Um, as Cookie Boys put so succinctly, the RBA is stuck in a big hole when it comes to rates. If other countries raise and we don't, the dollar tanks, import inflation takes off. So they'll have to raise. Yeah, I think they probably will. And look, they've said that they don't want to raise rates for you know quite, quite a long period of time. They will be forced to if international moves are higher. And it's very interesting. I was listening to some people from the UK talking about the UK economy where the government borrowing has actually come back a little bit. And now they're starting to talk about raise rates sooner. And of course, if the ambience around the world is that rates start to go up, we can't ignore that, right? Because as, as you say, uh, Cookie Boy, the exchange rate will get crushed. Now, the, they'd like the exchange rate a bit lower because, of course, that would help in terms of trade. But the fact is that we would then bring more inflation in. And... Um, it's worth just reflecting briefly on this concept of inflation, right? Because you can have inflation of um, costs. You know, there are costs rising. Health costs are up significantly. Some fuel prices are up significantly. Some food stuffs are up significantly in terms of price. But there's no real evidence yet of wage pricing inflation. And that would, me, for me, be a very different and significant indicator of structural inflation coming if wages started to rise significantly. Um, but... We'll have to wait and see whether that happens. Then you've got asset prices. And of course, asset prices, as we've discussed, stock market's very high, house price is very high. But those sorts of price dimensions are not flowing directly through into any of the official CPI numbers. And of course, I said before that the CPI numbers are pretty rubbish when it comes to actually trying to understand what's really going on. But the fact is that the official numbers, of course, conveniently skirt around things like asset prices and uh, house prices. They have this sort of rental proxy. Until recently, of course, rents were dropping. That meant that costs of living were actually for housing was going down rather than up, which is a bit nuts, right? That's the second type 
um, of inflation. The third type is the one that I discussed with Damien Classen over two or three shows quite recently, which is to do with these um, mathematical movements when there's a big dip and then it comes up then the up move looks a lot stronger than it really is. So that's, if you like, the, um, you know, the, the peak to trough moves. Um, and then the other is this disruption, the supply chain disruption, which is very significant, like lumber. Lumber went through the roof. It's come back now because basically they started chopping down more trees and putting more through the system. Now, of course, we are more exposed because we are reliant on many more imports than, for example, the US and the container prices have gone through the roof so that's another cost which will be added but even if you put all those costs in overall the net cost coming into Australia isn't necessarily that high so to me we do have tactical inflation I'm not sure we've got structural inflation and I'm pretty sure that there's no wages inflation which would be for me the critical leverage point that would highlight a change in strategy. So that's how I think about inflation. And there are lots of other models and lots of other ways of thinking about it, but that's my own view. So, and I still think there is an argument for saying that a lot of what's going on around the world could now be deflationary, right? I've highlighted the fact that the Fed and US stimulus is sort of going into reverse, reverse despite what everybody's thinking, right? Now that's deflationary, right? When they lend less, that's deflationary. When they throw less money out there in terms of handing out checks to people, that's deflationary. So there is a really significant risk here of deflation rather than inflation. Or at least we might get stagflation, which basically means cost of living go up, but wages don't. And that's the worst case that, that I see. And I have a nasty feeling that that could be perhaps where we're going to end up in Australia, where effectively we have costs rising, wages not, and more households then getting more caught big debt of course then interest rates start to move up because of course that's the other factor in all of this rates are very low at the moment they will move up eventually so there are a lot of important elements and it could well be that we see like cba they adjusted their benchmark rate for mortgages just slightly 15 basis points but others will do that to try and allow a bit more flexibility if rates do start to rise so you know, it's not all downhill is what I'm trying to say. And there are a lot of different factors that we need to get our heads around if we're trying to understand what's going on. And of course, that in turn translates then into a series of questions about where do I invest? How do I invest? What do I invest in? Right. Because this ain't straightforward. OK, let's see what else we've got in terms of other questions. Master Singleton asked this one. What are your thoughts on first home buyers? with just enough money to pay for a deposit. Well, yeah, the average number I've seen is for Sydney, 10.1 years for a first-time buyer, I think, is the latest, if you're going to save for a deposit. Of course, some first-time buyers have the bank of mum and dad, and I've done several shows on that. Um, so that's intergenerational wealth transfer to allow them to buy. And so that's quite strong. About 60% of first-time buyers have access to intergenerational funds. The parents, of course, enjoying the price growth, pull the equity out, hand it down to the next generation. But that's not good if you're a, uh, a household without rich parents. Um, and many people, of course, because of these fragmented part-time jobs, are hardly able to save for a deposit at all. And then, of course, they're thrown these lifelines from you know, the state and federal government with the incentives to try and buy, like the 95% uh, loan. And I discussed that with Edwin yesterday. The issue about the 95% loan is you've got to pay it back uh, and in fact, of course, the amount you'd be paying will be quite a lot higher simply because the rate will be a bit higher, but the amount you're borrowing is higher as well because the government is not paying your interest and principal repayments between 80 and 95%. All they're doing is guaranteeing the bank. They're protecting the bank. In other words, they're like a lender's mortgage insurer of last resort for the bank. And again, I keep coming back to this to say those stimulus packages are more about protecting the bank and helping the bank to lend than they are actually helping real households buy real properties. And yet, of course, the way it's positioned is just remarkably um, deceptive. And then another one from Master Singleton. The recently domain put a report saying that it would take first home buyers seven years, save for a deposit for a house. Depends where you look and what they're saving for. Um, it's probably longer than that, as I said earlier on. And um, interestingly, of course, if prices are continuing to run away, 
then they're basically not saving enough to catch up. I did a report uh, the other day uh, um, from an article that was in the SMH that made the point that the growth of the average house is bigger than the average saving that can be made by the average saver. So that they're actually getting further away from being able to buy rather than actually anything else. It's nuts, absolutely nuts. All right, let's see what else we've got. Cross Stitch Ange says, can we talk about investing in ourselves, education such as uni, TAFE, etc.? That's a great comment. And, you know, I find it really quite sad, and I've made this comment several times on this channel and with Tarek as well, that, um, you know, we had the opportunity, there was a big pool of money that the bank, that the, uh, that the government used through COVID, right? And yet, of course, it was most of it was thrown just at big corporations who didn't need it in the first place. Think of what would happen if that money had gone into investing in education and training and those sorts of things, you know, in, in, in real big, big volumes. Think of how much that could have changed the shape of our economy. So unfortunately, there is no ideological support for real capability building in the country. And that's something that I'm very, very annoyed about because it's the future. We are not investing in our future. We are investing in you know, building more houses and um, supporting the construction sector and supporting the banks, not actually investing in our future. So education, training, all of those things for me are absolutely critical and should be absolutely at the centre of any policy. And yet they're almost sort of squeezed to the edge. Um, and of course, I know that there's issues with... Um, healthcare costs and aged care costs and those sorts of things. But these sorts of investments are actually investments in our future, our collective future. And, um, you know, successful countries around the world invest in the future. In Australia, we are investing in the present. And unfortunately, the present is just uh, repeating those mistakes of the past rather than laying a foundation for a better future. So that's uh, why I think it's a big deal. Now, Ray asks, could less saving be increasing prices mean less chance to save? Yeah, well, people are, of course, are already draining their savings, as I showed you earlier on. Now, of course, the point about that is that households are in different positions. There are some that are actually very um, affluent and are actually able to spend almost, you know, without noticing. Others are actually in a different position and they've got small amounts of saving which they're draining away. Uh, unfortunately, quite a lot of them are now draining those savings, though, into just supporting day-to-day -day requirements. That's why the mortgage stress numbers are so high. So I'm seeing in my surveys a lot of people whose income is below what their outgoings are. And the way they square the circle is either to go get a, more money on a credit card or if they've got savings in the bank that eating those savings up and that's why in my numbers whether you are actually raiding your credit card or whether you're actually using um, your existing savings if you're actually paying out more than's coming in i put people in the stress category right because you can't go on doing that eventually the savings evaporate yeah, interesting question from ai as well um, well, that is, could another lockdown increase savings? Well, sure, what tends to happen is if things are locked down, then people can't spend, right? So they then, and they're not going overseas either. So that means they've got to ability to save again. So, and, and you know, the broad observation I have here is we have created this fortress Australia, right? So we've got this, these borders, which are a bit permeable with the, the virus at the borders. But nevertheless, people can't go overseas, so they can't spend the billions of dollars they would normally spend overseas on holidays and travel and those sorts of things. So they're spending it here. And we've also lost a lot of those temporary migrants, as I discussed earlier on. So that means that more people are now working in local jobs, low paid, part time, um, rather grindy jobs, but jobs nevertheless. Now, that sort of border strategy and that sort of Fortress Australia strategy can go on for a reasonable length of time, right? But ultimately, the question is, how are we going to actually realign ourselves to the rest of the global economy? Because the rest of the global economy is beginning to get to the point where the vaccine rollout is at the point where they can start opening up again. And so if we've got our Fortress Australia border protecting the economic um, microclimate that we've created here, um, I think that there will be a temp 
you know, there'll be a bit of a temptation from the current government to go to the election before we open up. Because the hothouse is economically better, if you look at it superficially, than it would otherwise be. Trouble is, it's not sustainable long term. And that's why I think we're in this really weird no man's land, as it were. And of course, as more lockdowns come, as you say, maybe people will save more. Smooth operator makes this point. I've lost another rental property on income. It's crap. Yeah, there's quite a few people, you know, with multiple investment properties who've still got quite a few not actually let now. And uh, in fact, the vacancy rates in some areas are quite high. Um, in other areas, what's happened is that we've got um, people who kicked out one old tenant, put the rent up and then tried to get a new tenant and then couldn't. And I'm seeing that in my surveys and a couple of one-on-one -on -one conversations recently. So people need to be a bit cautious about this because effectively, you know, maybe the, the, the tenant in the hand is worth two in the bush, if I can <laughs> uh, steal a phrase, right? That's uh, pretty interesting, though. And uh, TB makes the comment about the net savings rate. Yeah, it is interesting. It's dropping quite dramatically. And it's not uniform across all segments, right? So again, in my surveys, I see some groups who've had that little nest egg now pretty much eroded away. I'm seeing other segments where they've still got plenty of money and they're not really worrying too much. And that's part of the issue here, right? And I keep talking about the K-shaped economy in Australia, right? We've got a group of people who are doing quite well and are quite affluent and are enjoying the growth in property prices and the growth in the uh, share prices. But you've got this other group, the very large group, who are actually being caught. And so that's where the savings ratio is quite interesting. When you go granular, you can't just look at an aggregate level. <laughs> Crooked Boy said Roy Morgan for the win. Yeah, I think the Roy Morgan data is actually much more powerful. Um, it is more aligned with my survey data. It's what I'm seeing in my, my data sets. And, um, you know, the ABS official numbers, official quote unquote, are just so off the truth, it's laughable really. And then, of course, you know, you find the 300,000 um, you know, jobs that from temporary migrants that weren't included, and you think, well, hang on a moment, that means the number's just way off. And Master Singles makes the same point. I trust Ray Morgan data more than the ABS on the employment. Yep. And on, and on the um, confidence. The Roy Morgan confidence numbers are pretty close to my own. Um, I haven't actually published mine uh, that recently simply because I think Roy Morgan does a really good job and there's no point in just du duplicating. Now, this is from Ray. Does the gig economy lead to more unemployment, underemployment? As, yeah, the short answer is yes, absolutely. So when you've got piecemeal working and when you've got the gig economy, there are people doing the odd hour here and there. Remember the old definition from the um, from the ABS? If you work an hour, you're employed, right? And it goes into that bucket rather than the unemployed bucket, right? Now, there are a lot of people who are actually in the gig economy world working just a few hours, not being paid very much. Uh, and, you know, superficially in the numbers, that would look right. But if you look at it in terms of my cash flow data, um, it's not right at all. So absolutely, it's definitely distorting it. Cookie Boy asked about the New South Wales stamp duty removal. I personally think it's about pushing prices higher, higher tax revenue long term and raising taxes elsewhere. Yeah, I think you're right with that, too, Cookie. I mean, I, to my mind, the excuse is it's taking a huge hurdle off people, except two things. One is you're committing to a paying into the future at an unknown rate, so you don't know what you're committing to. And secondly, they will have, as they migrate from a big chunk of money to a flow of money, to find other ways to fill the gap. You know, nine billion, I think, was the last number I saw from the uh, New South Wales budget. That's a huge amount. So, yeah, I think that's right. And it's going to actually push prices higher because it means that people won't need to pay as much in stamp duty, which means they can afford to pay a bit more, right? So yeah, expect house prices to continue to elevate where those stamp duties are removed. And, you know, I would be very cautious if I was given the choice of um, stamp duty or um, a cash flow over time, I would think long and hard before I commit to paying every year for every year when I don't know what the rate will be. I don't know how much it will go up. And, um, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to live in the same property, but if it's a few years, I'm going to pay, end up paying a lot more later over the life of the property relative to the stamp duty that you pay up front. So for me, it's a con. Oh, 
What else have we got? Now, Ryan asked an interesting question. What's the best way to measure housing affordability? It seems the media doesn't want to have honest discussion about it. <laughs> Point to low rates. Yeah, very, very good question. So the, the way to think about it is, and this is the way I do it in, in my stress modeling, is I, I say, if I take a household, right, I look at the household budget, I, got, I know what money's coming out, I know what money's going out. How much can they afford to pay for either rent or a mortgage? Now, there isn't a standard formula like 30%. I mean, it used to be 30% that was often quoted. Um, that's all over the place now. So there are some people with a lot higher and a lot of people with a lot lower. Um, I think people have to actually do the calculation for themselves and basically make some assumptions about what, my, what is my income going to be? Um, what is the amount I can actually afford to pay and then sensitize it to interest rate rises? Because that's the other point. Affordability is not just about today's rates. Affordability is over the medium term. And remember, the interest rates are likely to rise. Um, the bank will be working on a bit of a buffer. Um, a lot of households that I speak with in my surveys don't do the same calculations with a buffer themselves. They basically say, what's the minimum I can get away with paying now? And don't ask any questions about what happens if rates go up. So they are then caught. And the other point here is that the banks have a different mental model in terms of affordability because they ask two questions. The first question is, is my loan at risk? And of course, if you've got equity in the property, they could always sell the property, repay the loan. So the risk scale goes down. The second is, is the cash flow going to actually trip any of the big hurdles? Because there are some uh, you know, hurdles that they still have, responsible lending hurdles and those sorts of things. And if not, then they'll make the loan. Now, those are not very accurate when it comes to true affordability. So there's a real mask over this. And then, of course, everybody defaults back to, well, of course, interest rates are really low. So therefore, affordability is actually you know, pretty good. Except if you've got a principal interest, you've still got to pay the principal every month too. And as the interest rate comes down, the proportion that you're paying every month is actually more and more principal rather than the interest, right? So as rates come down, there is a floor below which, in fact, affordability doesn't get better. And now we're there now, pretty much. And then, of course, the last point again is if people are going to actually think about shifting later and you know buying and selling and transacting, there's a lot of costs involved there. And that's again, people don't think about those. So not only do you think about the steady state cash flow, but you've got to think about all the costs of acquiring the property and um, you know getting the survey done and paying the stamp duty and all those things as well. Very few people model that before they commit. I'm very concerned about that. They should definitely do more work run some sensitivities in terms of what happens if interest rates go up two or three percent and the other sensitivity is what happens if my income gets disrupted you know if it's two incomes what happens if one income disappears um, those are the sorts of things that people do then they'd have a better handle over what affordability was but of course that's a more complicated conversation and the media can't cope with complicated conversations so. <laughs> a yogi bear asked this question what's the forecast on house listings looking like general thoughts on what's going on with them. Yeah, well, there's a quite a lot of information coming through my surveys that's suggesting that more people are considering listing, particularly some property investors. Quite a few units are coming through. Houses less so, so I think there's still a significant undersupply in some areas of, of, of houses, and a lot of people um, are down traders. They're looking to sell and to sort of get maximum equity out because they want to release equity, buy something smaller, maybe buy some investments and things as well, or maybe give it to the kids, right? Um, and it's not uniform across the country and it's not uniform across even postcodes. So it's going to be patchy. My own read of the situation is we will see a bigger supply coming on in the spring. And I've had a couple of conversations with some mortgage brokers and some real estate agents recently that suggesting there's been a real change in the weather in the last six weeks or so, where we had earlier on massive demand from prospective buyers, absolutely well over the supply. It's turning around now and they're starting to see greater supply and less appetite from buyers and actually buyers being a bit more coy about paying. So we'll see. Also varies by location, so there's still a bit of migration from uh, Victoria up towards Queensland. Still quite a lot of moving away from uh, smaller properties into areas where there are bigger plots. And 
There is this other thing that's going on, and that is still people are buying up a plot with a view to subdivision and building villas on it and those sorts of things. That's still pretty potent, actually. So that's something else that's there in the mix as well. So all of that's changing the story. That's why these one-on-one -on -one conversations are actually really useful, because then you can get granular and really understand the dynamics of a particular postcode. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at that, you realise how different those postcodes are and you know you compare some of the ones I've done recently if you go back and watch those back shows you can see how different the dynamics are in different locations so uh, that's a short uh, summary of what I'm seeing at the moment with regard to um, listings um, what else have I got um, Ray makes the point it would be good to see the male female ratio of changes in employment underemployment yeah that's true in fact there's been quite a rise in female employment um, relative to where it was previously that, that the females got hit on the, over the head by a four by two through the lockdowns so some of those have come back now and that's partly because of all the health care jobs and those sorts of things um, i am actually so seeing now more males than a year ago in multiple part-time roles and that's partly because some jobs have disappeared. Other jobs have actually morphed into smaller working hours. So we've got more males now, in my data, working multiple part-time jobs than previously. And that's not a good trend in my view, not least because very often it means that less people, um, you know, people get less money and income coming in as a result. <laughs> uh, Madeline's got a problem with her phone. It keeps sending the uh, the thing before she's finished sending it. Okay, keep 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 going, keep going. We'll get there. <laughs> Cross stitch hand says I've been casual working thirty eight hours a week for the past three years. My contract's renewed six months before they expire. I get no annual or sick leave, but my weekly pay is high. Yeah, that's that's some. Um, it's certainly the way that it's done in a number of areas. Um, a lot of people in the um, academic area, of course similar situation now they're actually um you know relatively fragmented piecemeal type per roles whereas previously they would have been um working full time and um they also avoid paying holidays and sick pay and those things too but you know it's a matter of trading off you know some people like the flexibility others would prefer different things um if they could get it but they can't now this is some um, from um i can't pronounce that if commodities are relatively high, why is the Aussie dollar somewhat low? The reason the Aussie dollar is down is because the US dollar is up. So basically you need to understand the sort of interplay between the strength of the US dollar and the, and the, and the Aussie dollar. When the US dollar is going up, as it is going up, if you look at the, um, the DXY, in other words, the, um, you know, the dollar index, it's, it's up from where it was previously. Um, and um, that means that our dollars come back as a result of it. So it's more to do with what's happening in the US than our own situation and in fact the Reserve Bank would quite like to have um, the uh, Aussie dollar lower because it would help our trade but the chances of them doing that is actually um, uh, quite limited I think at the moment let me just show you the DXY there you go I'll show you that there if I put that one there you go so that's the DXY you can see it's come up recently it's at 92 now um, whereas previously it was down to 89 so that's sort of the movement and that is the if you like the other half of the movement compared with the uh, with the Aussie dollar so that's the reason whatever happens in the US we go the other way okay uh, what else have we got Mr Cookie says so Cookie says Westpac says rates are rising in 2023 how long before we hear 2022 sooner rather than later I think rates will have to rise also bear in mind this, we're talking two things. The cash rate, which is the one that's set by the Reserve Bank, is the one that Westpac's talking about. Right? I am talking about real-life rates, mortgage rates. Right? The term funding facility ends at the end of June. That's the really cheap money, the 0.1% money. Banks will have now to access more expensive funds to be able to fund their book going forward, unless they change it again. If they do that, their margins will be squeezed. They will probably have to pay more on deposit. And that means that they're going to have to pay more on loans. So I'm already expecting to see mortgage rates rising over the next few months. A little. Not, necessar not necessarily the variable, but certainly the fixed rates are already moving. And CBA, as I mentioned earlier on, actually changed the base calculation by 15 basis points to allow for that. So 
I'm expecting to see those rates first. I think the Reserve Bank will try and hang on and not move sooner. But they could be bounced by the Fed if they start moving. And of course, we've also got other economies around the world, the UK economy, Eurozone, of course, as well. Um, so got to be careful about which rates we're talking about. Reserve Bank benchmark rate, by the way, the cash rate, there's almost no relationship to the cost of anything when it comes to funding loan books and things. So in a way, it's a bit of a sort of a, a furphy in terms of what they do, right? So they make a big play of it, but actually it's not the real, it's not the real story. Right? The real story is the three-year control of the yield curve. And as I highlighted, that's maybe now beginning to wobble a little bit. And of course, when that ends, that's when we start to see the real move up. Um, in the meantime, I think the banks will um, will have to pay more for their funds. That will put more pressure on mortgage rates, in my view. Interesting comment from Master Singleton, and that is that commercial rates are rising, yet yeah, SMEs are struggling. Yeah, I agree. Um, again, in my surveys, a lot of SMEs that I speak to in my surveys are saying, we can't afford to pay those rising rents. And, you know, a lot of them have back um, arrears, because they were basically allowed to not pay for a period of time. But many SMEs are still struggling. So, uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's not just in a particular geographic area or indeed an industry, it's quite widespread. I reckon about 40% of uh, SMEs have some issues with regard to their cash flow at the moment. And it's getting worse, not better. And um, again, remember, we've also got this other issue now where the bankruptcies are actually now allowed to flow through, whereas previously they were stopped. I was talking to the, um, the other day, talking to somebody who's dealing with the handling of distressed businesses and the closure of businesses, and they're starting to get very busy now, whereas previously they were very, very quiet. And uh, there are some changed rules in terms of how quickly people can actually um, deal with closing a business down. But nevertheless, there are increasing numbers, and the rental issue... And also the fact that they're still obliged to pay money to the tax man um, is going to be a big deal. Uh, okay, this is from uh, Lily. Interesting question there. What are your thoughts on the job people are working from home being transitioned out of Australia to a cheaper market overseas? Well, it's an interesting question that because, um, of course, we've had a number of um, large organisations move jobs overseas and then effectively the service levels drop and they then pull them back to Australia. Some of the banks have gone through that cycle. So I'm not sure whether that's necessarily going to happen at the sort of the macro level, but I know that there are a number of smaller organisations who have now realised just what you're saying, that they can actually source skills and capabilities internationally, virtually, and pay a third of the price. Now, given what I said about the pressure on small businesses, I think a number of those could be using those services. So I think it's going to be a big deal. I think it will be a further um, swing in terms of the employment um, landscape in Australia. And with some of the high tech businesses in particular, um, some of the best skills are actually not here in Australia. They're actually available internationally. So they would quite often reach out there. And the final question is, what about the government sector? You know, they're always now looking to try and save a do dollar or two. I wonder whether they'll look at that or whether, in fact, the publicity, if it got found out, would be so great they'd have to not do it. So it'd be interesting to watch that. But small businesses, absolutely, they're going down that route. Now, the new voice talked about um, the... Uh, Venture capital firms buying up property, not just venture capital, Black Rock's buying up. A lot of the property in the US is being brought up, bought up with a view to essentially um, holding it and then selling it again and making a profit or holding it and renting it out. It's a big deal and it's a huge impact in some areas in terms of rising prices. Um, unfortunately, those prices are actually not helping the broader economy. And um, interestingly, the momentum in the U.S. property market is quite strong. I just want to make the point, of course, that the U.S. property market, our property market, New Zealand, the U.K., they're all quite strong, low interest rates, all those things that are, that are there. But the phenomenon of venture firms and BlackRock and those people buying up property in the U.S., I've not seen it yet in Australia. If you know different, let me know. Send me a message because I'll be interested to know. But I haven't seen any evidence yet. But there's a risk that somebody starts that process here particularly if prices go on rising. So something to watch. <laughs> uh, 
how happy robots, robots is 70 year debt cycle go boom well there are these long term trend cycles you know Harry Dent and others are on about that and uh, quite a few of them argue that next year is when a lot of it lands uh, now of course that may be a flex because of the um, stimulus packages and the you know central bank in intervention but nevertheless these big cycles do tend to come to a bit of a, an end then of course is what next and that takes us into a conversation about negative interest rates central bank digital currencies about uh, all of those things right even things like UBI what happens after that don't know probably subject to a separate show but um, it's an interesting these long cycles I think are actually you know when I started looking at this years ago I always thought no nah, I can't be right how can you possibly see these long cycles but the more I look at it the more I think that people like Harry Dent are onto something it's just that maybe sometimes they're a bit too definitive on precisely when it hits Now, green grass is staying still on for August, September. So I assume you're talking about when I think the markets might correct. I'm still saying September. I've said that for about the last nine months. I could be wrong. However, <laughs> Harry Dent has been wrong for longer than I've been wrong when it comes to market corrections. Um, but look, it's interesting that if you look statistically speaking, when do markets start coming back after the summer? September, right? And when does the stimulus start winding off? Well, it's already starting, as I said, but it's going to hit a bit of a junction in September. So maybe I'm wrong. I think September could be interesting, but it does depend on the virus. If the virus comes back and we have more lockdowns and they have to throw more money at this, it could push it out a lot further. So in a way, it is contingent upon what happens with regard to the virus. And in my core scenarios, as you know, I have three based on the trajectory of the virus, because the virus and what happens to the virus is so connected to the economy it's not like either or it is the economy frankly it will affect it so dramatically so that's the way i think about it now javier asked about confiscation of wealth after a market crash there's a risk of that um you know we've talked in the past about bail-in of banks and those sorts of things um of course um in earlier cycles gold was um was grabbed um so yeah it is a bit of an unknown quantity and um, the question is will they could they well they certainly could will they depends a little bit I suspect on the state of play at the time uh, I think that the superannuation balances of people will be uh, potentially of interest to uh, governments particularly here in Australia because they're so big I also think that um, some of the uh, in uh, the, the super funds uh, you know where they've invested what they've invested in that may change as well so I think got to watch this and uh, again be cautious and careful about um, laying the foundations for flexibility I think flexibility for me is one of the keys that I would hold on to at the moment because there are a lot of unknowns and I guess the message from this show tonight is don't be fooled by thinking that this is all over that everything is now you know, it's plain sailing and we're out of the worst. And it's there are too many indicators that are still suggesting there are some very wobbly times ahead. And that's why I'm suggesting that flexibility and careful management of any investments, whatever they're in, is pretty important. And uh, remember that uh, things can go down as well as up. The Smooth says, if the Fed is already pulling back, just watch the crash will be the biggest issue well it will be by definition because they've got the, the biggest amount at the moment right so we are you know we're talking telephone numbers in terms of the amount of debt that's out there the amount of stimulus is out there and of course there's even evidence if you look at the reverse repo sector at the moment in the US it's, it's, it's looking wobbly in other words the Fed's having to support that sector even now so there are some early signs of some cracks in the um, infrastructure and um, yeah it could be big What else have I got? Just looking a lot of comments. As Michael says, very scary. Yep, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, I do still manage to sleep well at night. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the fact is, there is not many people talking about this stuff in a way that makes sense. Everybody's sort of just taking the, um, you know, the simple, um, the simple story and claiming everything's fine and the markets are fine and the world's fine. Um, you know there are some good things you know we've got the deaths down very low in australia and that's good and there's signs of some of the economy beginning to come back that's good but these fundamental issues about the structure of the economic um, superstructure around the around the world 
needs to be more talked about and shared because this is real stuff and it's important stuff and it could fundamentally change you know your own wealth and everybody else's wealth your family's wealth um based on what happens so this is this is really important stuff okay what else have we got just going down the list of chat okay <laughs> uh, there's a few there that I won't put up um, simply because I think um, this is an interesting one um, how do you track corporations buying family homes is there a source of data not a very good one other than that the FIRB publishes information with regard to international um, buyers of, of all sorts of as asset classes in Australia that's the data that shows that in fact the biggest buyers of assets in Australia is not China, contrary to popular belief. It's actually the US, and um, you know, Europe and UK is also there as well. Um, China's up there, but it's not by far the biggest. In fact, it's come back dramatically. So the FIRB, FIRB data, not very accurate. It's rather old, but that's about the the best way to find it. Um, but I also do talk to um, you know real estate agents on the ground and get a sense of who's buying what. And that's quite useful because I get a bit of a sense of whether it is some. Um, you know a corporate but that's more sort of flaky the data sets very very low ai says government banning underperforming super funds any thoughts yep so here's the point if everybody is actually brought up to the same level right which is what's going to happen um is that good or not well it depends on where that level settles. It could be that what happens is we actually <laughs> see a, a reduction rather than actually an increase in overall performance, right? I think it's really important that people take advantage to understand what their fund is. Remember also that the performance of the fund is not necessarily the same as the performance returns for you as an individual in the fund. That's because a lot of the fees are not included in the um, fund performance ma management matrix. And so it's important for you to understand what the performance of your individual um, portfolio is within the fund. Um, my general view is that this is more ideological than anything else. It's more to do a battle um, in favour of the retail super funds against the industry funds. It's more to do with... Um, prescribing specific behaviours that the government thinks they want. I'm not very positive about these reforms, but then I'm not very positive about the superannuation system overall because the overall fees are too high, the overall performance is actually quite low, and generally most funds don't disclose enough to make good information. Now, there are a few that do, you know, that's one of the reasons why Nucleus Wealth and I teamed up because they've got a much more transparent model for the way that they do things, but most super funds provide very little disclosure and I think the superficial benchmarks that they're going to use won't necessarily tell us that much that's my own view it could be wrong um, but as I say it's down to individuals to really take the time to understand the way that their super funds are actually working and how they're performing and th the final point about the consolidation into one fund I think that's a good thing because obviously people pay multiple fees if they've got multiple small accounts and often those fees are way too high relative to the balances that they're actually attached to. So consolidating and taking the super fund with you when you move from job to job makes a lot of sense. Happy with that. But this benchmarking thing and sort of ejecting low performing funds is fraught with issues in my view. Now, Ray asks about what's your thoughts on gold and silver? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it's quite interesting, isn't it? The old, the old gold conundrum, right? I remember somebody saying to me the other day, um, gold is going to be at $2,500 by the end of uh, June, right? Well, um, let me just go to that and show you that. Okay, well, it's sitting at the moment at 1785 and has been down rather than up, right? So it touched um, 1900 briefly and then has come back dramatically. Um, the thing about gold is it's not really a very good inflation hedge um, unless you fundamentally see significant growth you I mean the growth you know if you compare the growth of gold from 2012 to now well it's moved up and down a bit but really compared with the markets has not done that well um so i'm a bit skeptical i'm afraid i'm even more skeptical of silver i think there are some silver merchants out there literally um trying to flog silver uh, a lot of it of course is um, not even fully owned 
So this sort of marginal lending thing that's going on both in gold and silver. So you've got to be really careful with those markets. And um, the, the, real, the real story that I have is that these um, precious metals are highly manipulated. They are very much under the control of the major investment banks um, who have all sorts of hedges around them and they're used to manipulate and control the markets. So they're not full, open and transparent. And I don't think they're very good hedges personally. What else have we got? Taz asks an interesting question. How can central banks control inflation if it's not transitory without raising interest rates? Right. So it's about where growth comes from, right? So if you can actually generate growth without massive amounts of inflation, then there's a chance that you can actually drive it forward. But generally, the only lever that they pull is the interest rate lever. Now, if the interest rate lever goes up, does it necessarily translate into inflation? Well, it might. It might not. Depends on what happens to the debt pools that are actually being driven off it. So um, I don't think that increasing interest rates is necessarily directly inflationary. But we'll see. <laughs> Steve Van Meter says 12 to 1300 most by volumes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I certainly think that it's... Um, not going to be two and a half to three thousand um, dollars or even more like Peter Schiff and some of the other people have been talking about. Um, I just don't see it. But then I guess the point is, what do you anchor value on? Right? Is is the point of value the US dollar and then things move off that? Or is it gold and the US dollar? Move? Yeah. So if you start from the assumption that gold is the cornerstone, right, which some people do, and everything else moves around that, you get one set of answers. If you take the US dollar as the, the linchpin, as it were, um, you get a different set of movements. And if you use bitcoins as another, another linchpin, you get another set of movements again. So, you know, it's a matter of um, <laughs> where you start the conversation from. Uh, OK, if not gold and silver, what would be a good hedge? Well, what are you trying to hedge against is the question, right? So inflation uh, essentially means that we're going to see prices rise. Now, there are some groups of stocks that actually perform quite well in an inflation environment. So they may be ones to think about. For example, we know that some of the utility companies, right, will be able to put their prices up and will still be doing quite well. So they would be an example of the sort of um, investment that you might want to turn to if you actually want to try and deal with some inflationary pressure. So stuff that you have to go on paying for regardless, right? In other words, there's a thing that the um, economists call the elasticity of demand, right? So there are some things that will be highly elastic and there'll be some things that won't. And you need power, you need water, you need electricity, right? So those are the sorts of things that you probably, you know, won't want to cut down on. Whereas maybe other things like um you know your netflix subscription you might say well i'll perhaps i'll just have one subscription rather than three so you know that's an illustration of how you think about it david asked why do you know my question but answer the other person i don't know haven't done it deliberately david um did you put at what the world uh and um if you did i'll try and find your question or ask it again i'm not trying to ignore you honestly AI says, gold and silver, I never did like the shiny things. I'm just a simple guy. Right. David, David, what was your question? <laughs> when is the new gardening with DFA? <laughs> when Australia's show going live, says Yogi Bear. Thanks for the contribution. Good question. I'm up for it if he's, he's, he's growing carrots, right? Uh, I've told him, you notice I've told him you've got to put the carrot seeds in the, the right way up. <laughs> I don't know whether he's looked at carrot seeds. You know how small they are? <laughs> You've got no chance. <laughs> but um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, we might do a, we might do a one from the plot later in the year. We'll see. OK. Um, uh, Tran says, where do you think we are in the 18-year property cycle? And the answer is, um, I think we're quite close to the end of it. Um, maybe a couple of years, maybe slightly less. Um, Cookie Boy says, Lacantro says stagflation is coming. I think his case is looking pretty. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, 
a lot of uh, you know merit in in that point of view as i've explained i've got the view that um some things will definitely get crushed in the, in, in the process don't see my wages i don't see wages growing and therefore costs are going up and wages are that sounds like stagflation to me well david i can't find your question so i don't know when you asked it so I'll ask it again and i'll try and pick it up uh, what else have i got here Dylan says, I'm long on companies like TRMB infrastructures. Yeah, infrastructure is um, actually, I think, a reasonable, um, you know, we have um, some exposure to those sorts of companies. Too. Look, anything that basically you know is going to be required, come hell or high water, right? That's basically the way I think about it. Uh, uh, David, I haven't. I don't see it. I don't see it. So... Uh, I don't understand why I'm not seeing it. Hang on. Let me just go there. Does that change it? Uh, okay. Trying to see it, David. I see that one. But I don't see the question that you ask. So I don't know. Uh, have you asked a question? <laughs> uh, Okay, Ben asked, where to invest to protect your wealth given what's coming? Well, there's no simple answers to this, right? Everything has a risk attached to it. Generally, my own view has been to be flexible, to bear in mind that um, there are going to be significant disruptions in most of the f asset classes um, from property through. Um, over the medium to long term, you know, the, the stock markets still do perform quite well. Even if they come back, they tend to, um, you know, come up again. And of course, there are some significant opportunities with regard to the um, inflation that runs through, which means that their stock prices tend to rise. So I think it's good to have a portfolio of core stocks um, as part of it. Um, my own view is, and I, you know, this is just me, I, I, I'm, I'm holding money out at the moment in terms of um, term deposits and things, waiting for the correction. Um, I went into the market some, you know, a year plus ago in March, April when they dropped, and that was an opportunity. Um, didn't do much with the, with the crypto cycle because um, I wasn't convinced that I could read it. Um, gold and silver doesn't tend to be that attractive for me but others will actually have a very different different view but you know as i've said before you need a kernel of core investments and then if you want to have some stuff around the edge a bit of bitcoin what have you not a bad thing to do but um don't put all your eggs in one basket don't put all your eggs in a property basket either in my view okay david i'm looking for your question I still can't see it. Bondi Steve says, best investment hedge in Australia, classic cars. Yep. Well, there's some, a lot of people buying art, classic cars, and some of those uh, unique digital, digitally signed assets. Uh, who knows? Um, <laughs> Juba says, do a gardening edition. Yeah, okay. Mars says, should one put super into cash before the market crash? Well, there's an argument to say that, you know, the value is a pretty strong at the moment because of where the markets are. And so to lock in some of that may make some sense. Now, I don't give financial advice, so you've got to figure it out for yourself. But the trick is to know when to do that and then hold it and then hold, you know, hold your, your nerve if the market's got a bit further. The point I should make is it's very, very hard to pick the top and it's also hard to pick the bottom. So where we are, the chances are that the upside is much lower than the downside from where we are because the chances of the market's going much higher from where they are, I think, is relatively limited. So what that means is you want to be more conservative now than you were, you know, 18 months ago or back in March or whenever it was, a year plus ago when things were really down in the bottom. There, the most opportunity was upside rather than downside. It's the other way today. So that's the way I think about it. But people have different methods. And, uh, you know, not everybody necessarily has the same approaches as I do. But that's 
how I think about it. Oops. David found it. Can you please do a show with Professor Hugh White? I've been asking you for about a year. It takes two to can tango, right? I have actually contacted um, the professor a couple of times. Didn't get a response. So um, not sure I can do more than that. If you've got a way of contacting him, feel free to try and put him in touch. I'm very happy. I'm happy to talk with pretty much anybody that I can find, even if they have a different opinion, because it's all about sharing views and opinions. And I realise that it's now, it's now 9.30. One last question. What happens to house prices in stagflation? The answer is um, prices tend to go down because people can't afford to pay more. Thank you very much for that smooth operator. Um, appreciate the super chat there. Thank you for that. And for that one too, thank you so much. And what's that one? Thank you very much. Appreciate the super chats. It really is um, very gratifying to see people actually find this of value. Well, considering that I didn't have Tony on the show tonight, I think we did reasonably well. Um, we did seem to have hit the, um, the buffers in terms of timing. So I'm just going to go back to my um, presentation and I might just... Uh, just cut, touch the last couple of slides and then uh, take any fi final questions before we go. Um, that was what I did last time. For those interested in um, investing, uh, there is the Walk the World Fund uh, that was with Nucleus Wealth. Um, go across to walktheworld.com.au if you want more information on that, both in superannuation and outside superannuation. And it's, um, I think, an interesting time to explore that. Um, go to the DFA blog if you want more information. All my posts are there. There's the information about the blog. And of course, you can support our work via Patreon at various levels. And if you want to get the uh, information with regard to mortgage stress, there is actually the stress series, which is available there. You can go across to Patreon. The link is at the bottom there. And um, I also do um, 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 get some support from PayPal if you'd like to make a direct contribution to help us. There's the link there to do that. Or indeed, you can even use a QR code to send me some Bitcoin um, if you fancy that. And uh, there's a bit of merch on the channel as well. And next time, I've got Damien Klassen on, um, who will also be talking about investing today, and that's on the 29th of June at 8 p.m. Sydney time. And Damien, of course, um, will be chatting about his theories with regard to inflation, deflation. And, of course, we'll also be thinking about some of the market developments between this week and next week. There will be, any, there will be more. It's just one of those things. It's um, such a dynamic, fast-moving environment. So mark your diary for that. And um, just seeing whether there are anything else. Um, thank you very much for, whoops, let's push that one there. There. Thank you very much, Mark Singleton. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Nicholas says, what about the chat with David Icke? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah maybe it's on, <laughs> on the list. Um, TB says, great presentation. Thanks for that. Crypto says, thanks for your input. Um, Bondi Steve says, just remember, kiddies, people are still buying off the plan of high rise. I know, isn't it crazy, crazy time? Really, really, really weird time to be doing it. Um, thumbs up from edited three months ago. Lovely name for a, <laughs> for a, um, a handle there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. When's, when's Tony coming on? Um, hopefully I'll be able to get him on next month, but he's... Um, his personal situation with his family is a bit complicated at the moment. I won't go into detail. That's for him to share if he wants. But I have said to him, as soon as he's ready, willing and able, um, I'd love to have him on and um, be able to touch some of the other things. And um, um, Cookie Boy. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, Jason says, cheers. Um, very good. I'm holding on smooth. I'm holding on. Time to say goodbye from me. And uh, there we go. Thanks very much to everybody. So thank you very much for spending some time with me this evening. Have appreciated it. Enjoyed the conversation. And I'll see you this time next week. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.